Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ. Joining me for this segment, we have Sadek Waba, member of the President's National Infrastructure Advisory Council. He's also on the Global Advisory Council, member of the Wilson Center. Sadek, it's great to see you again. Welcome back to Trade Talks. Great to see you, and thanks for having me. You got it. And you attended COP27 last month. What were some of the key takeaways? I attended the COP27 a couple of weeks ago, and I think there are, I would say, three takeaways. The first is an agreement on the loss and damage, uh, which is basically industrial economies trying to compensate uh, poorer economies, emerging market economies, for the industrial damage that was caused uh, over the last 50 years or so. Uh, it's controversial, but at least they've agreed to. How it gets funded and when it gets funded, of course, are still to be decided. Uh, but there are two things which I think are very important uh, that came out of this. The first is the role of the private sector, uh, which is really going to be the main catalyst for pushing climate reforms across the board. Uh, and for that, we need to have a very clear standard of measuring what we mean by carbon emission. Uh, unfortunately, there are different groups coming up with different methodologies and that is not helpful, and we need to be able to standardize that as much as possible. And then the second element, which I think is very important, is energy transition. I think the war in Ukraine has demonstrated that it's very difficult to think of implementing uh, environmentally friendly uh, energy power, like wind and solar, when we have a crisis of, because of the war in Ukraine. Germany just signed a 25-year contract of LNG uh, to import LNG from Qatar. Um, that's not the kind of energy uh, people had in mind. Uh, and Germany was at the forefront of looking for clean energy and green energy. That's considered not exactly a clean energy. But LNG is part of the transition process, and that has to be accounted for given the crisis we're in. You've written about the need to greenify infrastructure. Can you explain what that means and what it means for investors and the markets? Absolutely. When you talk about greenify infrastructure, the first thing that comes to mind is, of course, uh, electric vehicles. If we're able to get electric vehicles, that will help in terms of climate change. But the electric vehicles have to drive on roads, and those roads are made of asphalt uh, and concrete and bitumen. Um, that is a major polluter. Uh, we talk about building wind farms. If you want to build wind farms to satisfy the Paris Accord reduction in temperature, uh, you will need to have the amount of steel equivalent to 22,000 Golden Bridge. But that steel, when it's produced, uses a lot of coal. So we can't simply say we need to build the wind farms because the wind comes from steel and the steel comes from the production, which requires still a lot of coal uh, as a consumption. So it's a circular effect. It's not enough to say we need to build electric vehicles and use electric vehicles. We have to understand the rest of the chain of supplies at work. Yeah, I mean, it's a great point that you make. We have these ambitious, costly mandates, yet the infrastructure for EV vehicle support is, is not there. And it's expensive. Plus, you also need you know, the, the skill set to be able to build these um, ambitious requirements. And you've also spoken about the U.S. entering an infrastructure decade. What, what are key economic and investment trends related to infrastructure that you're looking at in 2023 and beyond? Uh, for, to answer that, we have to go back and think of what the president, President Biden and his administration have achieved. Uh, they truly uh, were able to pass legislation that the last 30 years and the former presidents were unable to do uh, for all sorts of reasons. President Biden was able to do that in the form of the IIJA, the infrastructure bill, uh, in the form of the CHIPS Act, in the form of the IRA, Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, in the form of a global partnership for infrastructure initiative uh, with our allies looking to build uh, an infrastructure resiliency across the world that helps our strategic objectives and dedicating $600 billion for that. So there's a huge series of legislation and uh, actions that have been put in place in a way that no one has done that before. And that is why I believe 
we're really entering, I wouldn't even say an infrastructure decade, but a multi-decade where you're going to see over time American productivity increase and benefit from that. Right now we have inflation, we have supply chain issues, uh, we still have COVID with us, we have a war in Ukraine. So it's not clear uh, that we can discern exactly what has happened, although a lot has happened in terms of construction. People may not see it, but it's there, it's happening. And that I think is going to generate, as I said, not just American productivity, but encourage American manufacturing and businesses to develop and to strengthen themselves and frankly, not compete just in the domestic market, but compete internationally, which is what we want. With President Biden having recently met with President Xi of China, what does the US-China relationship look like today and how should markets react to that? The, the reaction has been, uh, the, the, the relationship has been deteriorating over the last decade, no doubt about that. Uh, and certainly since 2018, uh, when President um, uh, Trump uh, increased the tariffs, uh, that has further deteriorated. So the meeting that President Biden has had uh, with President Xi Jinping, I think is in some sense a turning point. Uh, for two reasons. The first is that President Biden has known uh, President Xi Jinping for quite some time. Uh, and if there's anyone who has the ability to craft a long-term strategy is this administration, and in particular, of course, President Biden. So I think that meeting was important to de-escalate the tension that we had seen over the last couple of years, uh, whether it's on Taiwan or on security issues. Um, so we definitely are seeking uh, peace and cooperation. But as the president said, we will compete and compete vigorously where we have to, uh, but we will cooperate where we need to cooperate uh, with a wish that we're able to find peaceful solution. Uh, Taiwan, of course, is the most important one, but the US made it very clear uh, two things. The number one, we continue to adhere to the two uh, China policy. And number two, uh, that we do not believe that China has the intention of taking any kind of military action uh, towards Taiwan in the coming period. And China has also said the same thing. They're looking for long-term peaceful solutions, uh, which is, I think is very important. So how have recent US pieces of legislation impacted US relations with China? Well, unfortunately, the legislation is mixed because uh, we have had legislation which has put uh, trade barriers and offered subsidies uh, to local industrial and manufacturing uh, businesses and encouraging onshoring, which I think from a national strategic perspective is necessary. Uh, that has certainly upset the Chinese, but has also upset, uh, as we know, uh, through the recent meeting the president had with President Macron of France, has upset our European allies and Canada. Uh, so that's an issue that we have to deal with. Uh, but at the same time, we cannot continue to rely on critical elements uh, for our economy uh, that is being built outside of the US or let's say in regions uh, which are fraught with conflict. We need to be able to ensure that we have security of supply and that I think is our primary, primary objective. Uh, but there is ways to do it in a way that is, like I said, win-win for everyone. Uh, so that um, this is the unfortunate part. The second unfortunate part are trade barriers against China, which were imposed in 2018 under the Trump administration that President Biden has continued till today. I think those are not helpful uh, from an economic perspective because we want to encourage economic growth. Trade barriers have never helped in economic growth. Uh, they tend to be economic losses ultimately for the consumers. And so many of us would wish those trade barriers to come down uh, and help in rejuvenate trade between the US and China and other countries. All right, Sadek, we appreciate the insight as always. Thanks for joining us on Trade Talks. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ. Thanks for having me.